Hello, my name is Yanshua Benjiu, and I'm going to tell you about machine learning for chemical discovery. There's a lot about chemistry and biology that we don't sufficiently understand to directly answer a lot of questions of interest. For example, um, which drug should we use to target a particular protein? Or um, how could we design a material that has such and such properties? And the problem is that the number of um, possible answers to these questions is exponentially large. So sifting through all the possible ones, either experimentally or using models is impractical. Now, the good news is machine learning can help us if we can collect um, enough data to train these systems. And we are collecting more and more data. Um, we are more and more able to measure, monitor, uh, experiment at large scale, um, build model simulations from physics and chemistry that can provide pseudo data. And machine learning can speed up these uh, physically based uh, simulations. And they can even be improved by combining the experimental data and the information coming from those simulations. So there is a great potential for AI to help modeling on one hand, and also to help us search through this exponentially large number of potential solutions to the problem of designing new chemicals or new materials. As an example of the uh, recent advances in machine learning applied to modeling molecules, I must talk about AlphaFold 2. DeepMind has been working for a few years on deep neural networks, based on graph neural nets, a particular kind of neural nets that I'll tell you about that can deal with inputs that are graphs or even outputs that are graphs. And they've um, trained on a very large number of uh, 3D structures for proteins to train a system that uh, can guess a good candidate 3D structure for a new protein. And they've beaten uh, in the CAS14 contest um, all of the existing methods, including their previous version, by a large margin, approaching the uh, score you would need to be comparable to uh, experimentally determined structures. Now, that's to uh, eventually help us uh, answer questions whether a given um, uh, target protein and a given, say, drug uh, are uh, likely to bind together. But how do we search through the huge number of possible drugs or the huge number of possible um, materials or the huge number of possible uh, DNA sequences or peptides? Um, they, the, the numbers are astronomical. And so that search is, is something that we can use machine learning to help us with, as I'll try to convince you searching a needle in the haystack. So more generally, machine learning has been used to predict properties of a uh, molecular candidate. For example, in drug discovery, it might be toxicity, drug likeness, synthesizability, binding to a car target, of course, absorption, and so on. And in all of these cases, we need data to train those predictors. Uh, and the data, as I said, could come from experiments or could come from um, uh, molecular simulations. Now there's also uh, machine learning being used to help us uh, guess what protein might be a good target for uh, therapy. And that's an interesting area that I want to talk much about that, that I'm uh, working on as well, where we're using new advances in causality and machine learning to attempt to um, build a causal model of the cell or the immune system, trying to systematize what biologists have uh, been um, you know, painfully building through a lot of experiments in terms of knowledge of um, uh, molecular pathways. 
Um, so I, I talked about the modeling of dynamics uh, of um, molecules, for example, to guess protein structure. Um, and in general, one really exciting area of research that I also won't have time to talk about, but I think uh, this particular group com could contribute quite a bit is combining physical modeling and machine learning. So I already mentioned that you could do that simply by combining different sources of data, experimental data and pseudo data generated by models, physical models. But in principle, and people are starting to do that, um, you could do something more subtle where you change the structure of the machine learning uh, architectures to incorporate preferences or constraints that will favor solutions that are consistent with what we know from physics and, and, and chemistry. Now, one advantage of doing this is speed. One reason why people are using machine learning these days uh, instead or sort of as a supplement to uh, physical modeling is because you might get huge speed ups, uh, orders of magnitude. But, but another thing that hasn't been explored that much is, as I said, combining simulations and experimental data. So these models that include some physical constraints um, have three parameters, a lot of them, that allow them to be fit more precisely to experimental data. There is um, finally an area that I will spend more time on today, which is the, the search in the space of molecules and therapies. It, you know, it, it, we can't go through all the possibilities, but we can use machine learning um, to learn a policy for searching in that space. Okay, so why is machine learning becoming so appealing uh, in chemistry and, um, and, and, and in particular medicinal chemistry? Um, essentially, it's two factors. One is we're building technologies that allow us to collect much more data. Uh, high throughput screening and high throughput synthesis uh, with robotics or synthetic biology suddenly allow us to uh, create systematic assays where we can evaluate tens of thousands to millions or hundreds of millions of candidate solutions. And then machine learning is also making progress in the last few years. And um, I'll mention a few of these areas, of course, deep learning, representation learning, reinforcement learning to learn a policy, active learning that I'll mention quite a bit to be able to um, uh, allow the learner to propose uh, experiments and um, uh, Bayesian optimization being a, a special case of that, ideas about exploration that's connected to the search, causality that I mentioned um, and, and, and other uh, uh, directions of research in machine learning. So first of all, the speed up. Um, uh, there are many papers out there. In um, my group, we've worked on a, a graph neural network that can approximate the output of a drug synthesis planning software called M1 score. And it can do a pretty good job in a, with a huge speed up, like 250,000 times speed up. Now, of course, one problem with these kinds of neural nets compared to a physical model is that they tend to work well uh, on the same distribution of examples that they've been trained on, but there's no guarantee that they will generalize out of distribution compared to physical models that tend to be more robust to that sort of thing. Uh, and that's one of the exciting research areas in machine learning these days called out of distribution generalization. So a few words about graph neural nets. Whereas traditional neural nets take vectors as inputs and, and, and gradually transform these vectors into more and more abstract representations and eventually produce outputs like uh, classification probabilities, the graph neural nets can operate on graphs. So the input is a graph and the same parameters are gonna be used for each node or each edge, but uh, fed with different 
um, input values. So we may observe particular features um, of each atom or each group of atom uh, corresponding to a molecule. And, um, and then we're going to use message passing to iteratively compute uh, new quantities at each node that uh, after enough uh, steps will depend on the whole graph. And we can apply this to molecules, but we can also apply it to uh, a whole knowledge graph, meaning the nodes now represent molecules, uh, uh, maybe proteins or drugs, and the edges uh, may represent data that we have about their interactions. Okay, so, so let's go back to this ability of uh, machine learning to make predictions. If we have supervised learning pairs where, so for each input, say uh, X is a molecule, Y is a uh, binding affinity uh, evaluated using a, a, a physical model or an experiment, um, we can train a predictor F such that f of x approximates y on the training data. And we can test using held out data that it actually generalizes on similar, I mean, pairs coming from the same distribution. And we can also test whether it generalizes to fairly different distributions. For example, uh, coming from different studies, or um, if we're talking about proteins, maybe train on different species and test on new species and so on. So we can think of this supervised learning as building a uh, world model. Like, uh, the part of the word we care about here is how the structure of a molecule influences some outcome Y. Here, Y is a scalar. And uh, you know, we would like to maximize that scalar. So we could just try all the possible molecules uh, and apply F to all of them and pick the most promising ones to then evaluate them with a more expensive calculation or, or in vitro. Um, but uh, as I said, there are just too many possibilities here. Okay, uh, and to reinforce that message, uh, if we have such a model that gives us a speed up in evaluating a bunch of candidates, um, we can look at the, the gain we're making in terms of the search, right? So, um, if we can uh, evaluate a thousand times more molecules in the same uh, duration, um, we can shift the, the slope that relates the number of, um, um, of candidates being screened to the time it takes uh, to do that. And, and we, can, we can get you know, a, a shift in that slope, but it's only a linear gain at the end of the day. The problem being that we have this exponential number of, of candidates to search through. So linear gain is not going to be enough. What, you know, how can we do better? Well, to do better, we're going to uh, have to consider the ability of the machine learning system to make queries, to propose experiments. So let's consider we are able to do that. And let's call the experimental uh, bench or uh, assay system an oracle that can give us answers to questions. So the questions may be a molecule and the um, answer might be a number that we would like to be large, say. And we want to search through um, that huge number of potential molecules. We won't be able to try all of them, but if we're smart about the questions we ask, we may be able to zoom in on, on uh, interesting solutions. And this kind of uh, algorithms are called uh, black box optimization, but they you know, uh, are part of a bigger uh, research area of scientific discovery using AI. People are using this to discover new drugs, new materials, uh, and even to discover new causal models that could explain some data. Now, there are a lot of interesting aspects of this. Um, when the learner makes initial uh, proposals, it needs to explore sufficiently. But when it gets near the end of its budget of you know how many times, how many times can it um, um, request uh, an, uh, an answer, um, it should probably uh, be doing uh, less uh, exploration and, and and exploit the knowledge that it has acquired 
to make the best possible guesses. Now, an interesting thing that happens in practice is our experimental setup, or even if we're using a simulation and we have access to parallel computing like GPUs, um, it allows us to really query many different molecules at the same time. So we really have a batch of queries. And when you have a batch of queries, there are new issues that come up that I'll tell you about. Um, you really wanna be even more exploratory. You need the different queries in each batch to be different from each other. You want a, a form of diversity of these queries. So the notion of diversity and exploration is important in all this. Now, there is a classical method in machine learning called active learning. And uh, now we call it pool-based active learning because it's, um, it's relying on the idea that a learner can ask questions, but the questions are taken from a fixed set, the pool of possible questions. So if you had a, a big library of molecules, say uh, drug-like molecules, um, you could use active learning to decide which one you're going to do an experiment with, um, you know, one after the other, you would have to ask many such questions. So uh, again, we have an Oracle that maps inputs X to outcomes Y, um, and we're gonna learn a predictor F, uh, lowercase f. We also define a loss function that, that's going to tell us how well is our prediction doing compared to the actual outcome Y. And we're gonna train this using the data we have acquired up to now. But we can also use an algorithm that um, tries to guess what would be a good query or a good batch of queries to do next. And the most common heuristic in active learning is based on the amount of uncertainty we have about F at a particular point. Uh, and I'll come back to that. Now, the problem with this classical active learning approach is that there are just too many possible Xs and we can't screen all of them. I mean, the uh, given library might be good, but we'd like to be able to explore beyond that library. And there's a lot of possibilities. So for this, in addition to the supervised learning machinery, which I call the world model here, uh, we need uh, another learning system uh, that's going to be coupled with it that can propose experiments. So uh, I think of that as a, uh, a searching policy or an experimental design policy. And it, it proposes uh, either a, a single experiment or a batch of experiment. And the way that it comes up with this is through interaction with the model. And I'll explain why we want to do that. So on the right hand side, we, we see the real world, which could be a, a, an expensive simulation or it could be an actual experiment. And um, we see that uh, the machine learning system sends these queries. We can accumulate the outcomes of these queries in a data set. Um, and then as we accumulate more data, we can fit our world model better and better. Then we're gonna have these iterations where the, um, the, the, the generative exploratory policy is going to train itself in silico to try to ask questions which might be uh, useful, um, uh, but in, in, you know, uh, through an interaction with the world model. Once it's sufficiently kind of confident that it, it, it understands the world uh, and what might be interesting there, it actually proposes uh, experiments for the real world. Okay, now one aspect of this policy is that it may have to propose something complicated, not, not like a single number or a vector, but, but a, a molecule. And so the one reason why we think of it as a policy is that it's going to decompose this action of generating a query as a sequence of smaller steps, like adding an atom to a molecule or adding um, a, a fragment to an existing molecule. Okay, so th then what we have uh, in that policy is a sequence of such actions that build a molecule. And then there's a whole graph of possible paths you could take um, in, in doing so and, and generating many possible molecules. So we are going to use reinforcement learning uh, or related methods to learn such generative policies that propose queries. 
and they can be rewarded by how um, useful according to the our world model or according to the real world are these molecules. This is gonna be um, useful because it's going to allow us to go from the linear speed up that I was talking about before to uh, something that could be exponentially better. So, I mean, it seems like a, a big gain and, and it's the principle is actually very easy, right? Um, instead of trying all the configurations, uh, we can uh, optimize a configuration. We can start with a molecule and then make small changes to it and in the direction that gives us better outcomes. So if we have a world model, we can interrogate the world model. We can try a few things and pick the things that work uh, better and, and go down in this uh, energy landscape or go up in, in you know affinity or something like this. So this is a, an optimization uh, approach. One problem though is that um, there may be a lot of local minima in, in this uh, landscape um, or local maxima if you're maximizing. And we would like to find not just a you know, single locally good solution, but be able to explore all of these um, uh, local minima and, and all of the good solutions. So one approach to do that is to use Monte Carlo Markov chains, very popular in physics and chemistry. Uh, we can start with a solution and then instead of just going down, we can sometimes accept going up. And if we do this right, then um, we can uh, create these trajectories, which eventually sample from the right distribution, meaning a distribution that um, samples configurations, in other words, molecules, uh, with a probability proportional to uh, some reward, which uh, you know we would uh, here call uh, associate with um, e to the, some uh, non-physical energy here. Energy might be physical or it might be something abstract. Um, so if we use MCMC like this, in principle, we can visit all the modes and get samples from all those modes. And in fact, get samples in proportion to how good the samples in those modes are. Um, so that's great, but there's a problem. Um, uh, in, in many interesting high dimensional problems like what we have, uh, visiting all the modes is, uh, might take exponential time. So we've gotten rid of an, an, an exponential time uh, having to screen everything and replace it by another exponential time. Um, that has to do with the problem of mixing between modes, a well-known issue with MCMC. So if the modes are um, kind of small in the total volume of space, uh, the areas that are interesting are occupying a small fraction of the total. And if there are many such modes and they are separated from each other uh, by regions of uh, low reward, then um, we're in trouble. So um, yeah, so that's the that's the the, the, the mixing problem, and uh, it's illustrated in the bottom uh, figure here. That uh, the issue is that MCMC methods make small steps from one configuration to a neighboring configuration, and either accept or uh, or not. Uh, and the problem with these small steps is that um, the probability of making steps that are uh, not improving or even uh, getting worse um, uh, as you have to do if you have to do many such steps that probability goes exponentially down um, and and that's what makes it difficult to mix from one mode to another mode um, so the question is can we do better now on the right here i have a figure that suggests we might be able to do better so imagine you have discovered these three modes uh, in red they're separated from each other. So it's kind of hard to go from one to the other. Um, but there is a structure to how those modes are placed. I mean, they're on a, a points of a grid. And we've found three of these, uh, which suggests maybe there's a fourth mode at that uh, you know, intersection we haven't visited there. Um, so machine learning could potentially discover that kind of thing, right? Um, this is called systematic generalization. And uh, this is uh, something we are uh, exploring in machine learning and it's a very hot topic. How does a machine learning system that's been trained on some data generalize somehow far from that data? Um, this is called out of distribution generalization in general. Um, and what we've been investigating is methods that use a generative model uh, that's been trained to know, you know, uh, in what it has seen, what are 
uh, good configurations, good molecules, and, and what are bad molecules to generate uh, good ones. So um, there is a lot of research in machine learning on generative models, and uh, that can be exploited here. Now, uh, one problem with the standard generative models in machine learning is that they have they're normally trained with just the um, good examples, like uh, molecules that work. And typically, you don't have that many of them. Um, and so what we have done is we have designed um, a, uh, a learning procedure that can be trained using all of the data that you're collecting, including the things that didn't work or the things that work partially. So instead of having just it works or it doesn't work, um, we, we associate with each example the outcome, y, which is a real value. And we can think of it as a reward. We'd like our generator to sample molecules in with a probability proportional to that reward. And it turns out it's possible to do that. Um, now, you know, there's an exponential that has uh, somehow uh, disappeared here because to, to sample from these models, which we call uh, G flow net for generative flow network, you, uh, you can do it in one pass through the neural net. Uh, so how, you know, how is that possible? Well, we are hiding the complexity here in the learning, the training itself. So uh, as the system is gonna be trained on all the data we have acquired up to now um, and the ability to, um, to query our world model, it, um, it's going to uh, learn to generalize in places it, it has uh, never seen any data. And, um, in the worst case, it might take exponential time to train such a network so that it knows what are the good answers everywhere. But if there is structure in the, uh, the environment, then it might be able to discover that structure. You know, I showed a very simple structure here as a grid. In the real world, it's gonna be more complicated. Um, and we'd like our machine learning system to discover such structure that allows to guess what are potentially good places, potentially far from the molecules we've already tried, but somehow, um, maybe sharing some uh, pieces combined in a particular way, um, you know, uh, and then, and then uh, sample in those areas. Um, so the, that uh, new approach, I, I won't have time to go into the detail, but you, you can find um, more detail in, in the paper that's on archive. Um, and it's interesting because it, uh, it, it is a form of reinforcement learning, but it can work off policy. In other words, we can train it using data that's not generated by the policy that it learns itself. Um, and it works even if the configurations that we want to generate can be obtained from multiple paths. Uh, and, and that's the case when we construct molecules by adding pieces. Um, so it's a very exciting new approach to solving particular reinforcement learning problems that arise in, in the setting of searching. Now, let me uh, briefly talk about um, how we're going to um, evaluate that a candidate is good uh, according to the world model. I mean, so we can take a candidate and send it to the real world, but that's expensive. Uh, so while we're training the generator, the policy that proposes queries, um, we would like to be able to score candidates so that it's, um, the generator will propose things that not only look good in terms of the outcome looks good, but also looks different from the things we've already generated so that they, there is information to be gained. And also that it, uh, if we generate a batch of candidates that they're uh, uh, sufficiently diverse. All right, so to explain um, this uncertainty aspect, I need to uh, uh, remind some uh, what is epistemic uncertainty and aleatoric uncertainty. So aleatoric uncertainty is just noise. It's the part of the uh, error, say, the prediction error that is uh, due to the intrinsic unpredictability in the data. Um, instead, epistemic uncertainty is the part of the error which is due to the learner, due to the fact that the Maybe we didn't get enough training data or a model is not um, uh, rich enough or something like that. So um, it's important to separate these two things because 
the uncertainty we're looking for here is the epistemic uncertainty. In other words, the uh, configurations that are interesting uh, to send to a, an assay are those that have a high epistemic uncertainty. Um, if, if there is a lot of noise in our experiments, uh, that's not something we want to spend a lot of time on, uh, or at least we don't want to consider that as part of our criterion for deciding that something, some uh, candidate is interesting. So how do we estimate epistemic uncertainty? The classical approach uh, that's uh, used in what's called Bayesian optimization is to consider a family of uh, potential world models, potential functions F that predict the outcome Y um, and use a Bayesian approach to give a probability to all of these potential functions. Um, that's called the posterior, uh, the Bayesian posterior. And now uh, look for a, um, a, uh, the uh, agreement or disagreement between all of these functions. So we can measure that with the variance between those functions. When we say sample those parameters of those functions, uh, parameters W um, uh, from the posterior, the Bayesian posterior distribution given the training data. So we're getting two things from our Bayesian model. We can get the mean prediction which is sort of the consensus of all those functions. And we get the variance, which is how to disagree. And where to disagree a lot um, is uh, probably a good place to look at uh, so we can resolve that uncertainty. In the figure, what we see in the uh, dotted line is the unknown uh, true function. And um, in the um, uh, dark blue, uh, what we see is the mean prediction uh, of all of these uh, compatible functions. Uh, and then the sausage in uh, light gray, light blue is um, you know, the, sort of uh, the uh, envelope of all of those um, uh, plausible solutions. Uh, so basically it's like mu plus or minus sigma. Now, uh, there are many ways we can combine mu and sigma to come up with a kind of heuristic score to decide that a point is interesting. For example, there is the uh, upper confidence bound or UCB, which just adds up the mu and, and sigma with, with a scalar uh, in front of sigma. Um, we have a recent paper showing that they, uh, unfortunately, the um, uh, Bayesian approach or uh, other related approaches called ensembles uh, tend to underestimate the true uh, epistemic uncertainty. And so we, we've been looking at training a second neural net, which predicts the uh, losses of the first one, um, subtracts the aleatoric uncertainty, and, um, and that gives a calibrated uh, estimator of uh, uncertainty. Um, so we've been uh, playing with uh, many of these algorithms, um, and uh, I'll quickly uh, summarize some results. So this um, illustrates what happens with our reinforcement learning based uh, approach to search iteratively by calling an oracle. And what we find is that these uh, machine learning based search methods um, uh, make progress exponentially faster than um, a random search or uh, you know, going through a list of, of candidates and trying them all. So on, in green, uh, we see the progress of this random search. Um, on the x-axis is the number of calls to the Oracle, number of experiments that you want to do if you want. And uh, on the y-axis is how good or the, the best solution you found up to now. Um, because the x-axis is on the log scale, you see that you know, whatever method we use um, takes exponential time to find a solution at a given level of performance. But the, the machine learning uh, approach um, uh, converges uh, exponentially faster, needs exponentially less time. Um, we've also tried the GFlow net, um, uh, uh, both on synthetic data and molecules. And what we find is uh, it converges even faster than standard reinforcement learning. Uh, but it, what's also exciting is that it finds much more diverse solutions. Uh, so that is, uh, that is something uh, important in, in uh, many practical settings because of the, those um, batches and because at the end of the day, the chemist wants not just one solution, one candidate, uh, but, but maybe uh, you know, a, a set that, that they can um, uh, 
look at and, and evaluate experimentally. Um, on this, uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to answer your questions.